welcome to this shared event by the Danube Institute and MCC on the Darwinian journey into gender. Um, we're, we have, um, we're going to discuss what makes the topic of gender and biological sex so controversial. How the ideological controversy surrounding this topic play out, they play out the academic landscape, and what we can do to open up space for science, for the pursuit of truth at our universities. And with us today are three excellent speakers. Uh, first speaker, Dr. Leonardo Orlando. He's a political scientist, philosopher, and evolutionary psychologist who earned his PhD from at uh, CM Po, and he was scheduled in 2022 to teach two courses there on evolutionary psychology, but they were uh, just two weeks before the start of the semester, they were canceled because a gender studies program had intervened for ideological reasons. Then we have Rodrigo Ballester. He's the head of the uh, uh, European Studies Center of MCC. And uh, like David Martin Jones, the director of research at the Danube Institute, he is concerned about the discourse about gender and sex at our universities and uh, worried about the uh, status of truth-seeking in our academic landscape. Now, the fact that, we, that biological sex is binary and that biological sex and genetics shape and strongly correlate with a wide range of behavioral patterns and inborn inclinations. And the fact that almost everyone, very boringly, has the gender identity that corresponds with their biological sex is, for a variety of reasons, ideologically controversial. Why is it exactly so ideologically controversial? Um, Coyne and Mar Maroya argued in The Skeptical Inquirer that it is radical egalitarianism, a radical egalitarian impulse ideology that, that makes these topics controversial. Quote, nearly all the ideological driven distortions of biology come from one mindset, radical egalitarianism. This is the view that the sexes Different ethnic groups, and to some extent individuals in a population, are genetically nearly identical in behavior and psychology, and that most behavioral differences are due to socialization and other environmental effects. Now, end of quote. So it seems that the um, that what is what how this expresses itself is that. People with uh, a certain normativity, with certain normative concerns, with an idea of how the world should be, are taking the science and try to override the actual empirical data and insights. Uh, quote, if you are a gender activist, you must see more than two biological sexes. If you are a strict egalitarian, all groups must be behaviorally identical and their ways of knowing equally valid. And if you're an anti-hereditarian, a blank slater who sees genetic differences as promoting eugenics and racism, then you must find that genes can only have trivial and inconsequential effects on the behavior of groups and individuals. End of quote. Now, interestingly enough, it's, a, it's probably not just modern, democratic, radical egalitarianism, leftist ideologies in the present day and in perhaps the early 20th century as well, of course, that, um, that, that make these topics controversial. Yeah, there, there are some indications that the fact that men and women are different biologically and that this has, in, in all way, kinds of complicated ways, interacts with uh, differentiated social roles in society and differentiated expectations in culture, uh, there are indications that this, this has been controversial also for other reasons in previous decades. So in... In Plato's Republic, Socrates, when outlining the perfect republic, stresses that men and women should have be ex in should be completely equal in all regards. So, um, so he was he was one of the first to to sketch this ideal of radical identity between men and women. Um, Akhenaten, 
the pharaoh in the 14th century BC who was unique in depicting himself in an androgynous way uh, may have, and this is a theory that some, some, hold, some um, archaeologists hold, may have tried to depict himself an, in an androgynous way, which is very unusual for the pharaohs, in order to be more, have a more total authority. He, he, the great pharaoh, represented both the male and the female. So perhaps there is a longing, a deep longing in the humanity for the identity of male men and women, for, the, for a longing for the erasure of the biological distinction, which seems so imperfect in many ways. Or, and perhaps in the present, there might also be a longing for chaos, the chaos of 72 newly emerged gender identities, let's say. Um, so, so what is going on? What makes this topic so controversial at, at, at present, and what are the deeper, deeper ideological motives? Uh, first, I would like to ask um, uh, uh, Dr. Dr. Orlando, um, what, happened, what happened to you at Sciences Po? Uh, what happened to your courses? And do you see similar things happening throughout the European uh, academic landscape? Good evening. Thank you very much to the MCC and to the New Institute for the invitation. Um, so I, I will uh, quickly explain what happened at Sciences Po uh, to dive into more interesting matters maybe later. Um, so at Sciences Po there were these two classes, uh, two courses. One was um, Evolutionary Political Psychology. That was the title. It was a course. I am a political scientist, but I did my postdoc in Cognitive Science and Evolutionary Psychology. Um, and my research focuses on this, trying to apply evolutionary theory to understand political behavior. And one of the courses was particularly on this, like, for example, trying to understand fake news, terrorism, lots of uh, political polarization, lots of phenomena from the point of view of the brain, of the mind, of Darwin. Uh, the other course, and that was the tricky one, was um, evolutionary approaches to gender. So um, it was a pretty straightforward story. It was the, the courses were plenty confirmed. I mean, uh, there was like a classroom and the time and everything, and it was like that for a couple of months. And literally nine days before the beginning of the semester, uh, the courses were canceled due to a call from, literally a call, this is not a metaphor, a call from the gender scholars at Sciences Po who uh, asked the direction of the institution to deplatform these two courses. And um, just two important things. First of all, at that precise moment at Sciences Po, there were literally 82 classes on gender, of course, from the point of view of gender studies, 82 there were going to be one more <laughs> even truth from the point of view of you know, Darwin. Well, no. And secondly, why Sciences Po matters? Sciences Po is the institution that trains over 90% of, of the high functionaries, of the high civil servants in France. Out of the eight president of the Fifth Republic in France, five have gone to Sciences Po, including the current one. There were 12 prime ministers, including the current one that have been to Sciences Po. So it's not something minor. Um, but still, this is not rare at all what happened at Sciences Po. At the very same time, and when I say the same time, it's literally that very same month, I believe, or in any case in spring 2022, um, there was a biologist who was going to be just a talk on issues of gender from the point of view of biology, something that others also call reality, um, and she got the platform. And there were two psychologists, professor of psychology in Spain, who were going to present uh, their book on these topics at the University of the Balearic Island, and uh, they got also cancelled. So to reply to your question, this is something that it's going on everywhere in the West. Um, one particular example, I mean, I could give you a lot. I could actually keep you here all night telling you the, the, the horror stories, all the things that the people had that have been cancelled, uh, but also people that have to give up their careers. Um, I'm not going to say myself, even if that's the case, but for example, one, one case um, that I think it's sad but very enlightening about this phenomenon, it's Colin Wright, who uh, is a biologist. So a biologist, who he dared to write a piece on the Wall Street Journal to say that, you know, there is male and female, and his career was over. And the most interesting thing, and I will finish with this, is that before that he published this piece, all his colleagues 
told him that he should not do it. And that's actually also what happened to me after I've spoken. All, all the colleagues were like, why did you speak out? Why did you do that? And you know, well, because this is a problem. Anyhow. Yeah, so obviously there is a lot of ideological pressure on this subject. And you've experienced that pressure uh, at, uh, at close hand. Um, but what, where does it come from? What, is, what are the ideological drivers of, of the controversy? What, what puts the ideological pressure on this topic? There is um, an evolutionary psychologist uh, who, uh, in one of his books, uh, says, everybody understands the difference between a man and a woman except social scientists. So that's the reason why. The world building, the entire building of the approach to gender in the social sciences, it's built on a lie. It's built on something that is flat earth wrong, that is either that sex differences do not exist or that if they exist, they are the product of socialization. Nobody is denying socialization. Nobody is denying discrimination, maybe in some cases. But there is a reality that most of differences in behavior between men and women come from bio biology and can be explained by the theory of evolution. And I, I could go into a long list. I will not do that. But if you check anything from like things that are really actually in, 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 in the policies, in the institutional policies of lots of countries of the European Union, let's say toys, right? Just to take a very easy example, like, well, if girls play with dolls and if boys play to, with um, games of aggression, um, that is because of socialization. Well, that's flat earth wrong. It's like chimps, female chimps, play with logs as if they were babies. And males, child everywhere in the world, in any culture, they play to games of aggression. Well, that's because of evolutionary reasons, because, you know, men hunt, war, women, taking care of children. And it has been going on for some time. So that's one of the reasons. But then there are many others that the, the list is long. And the problem is that when you start denying that, when you bring Darwin into the equation, when you bring Darwin into the picture, this world house of cards that gender studies have built, it crumbles. So there is only one way for them to prevent their building to crumble, and that's to cancel, to censor. David, you have written um, in various publications and in uh, your, uh, your two most recent books, about the ideological trends in the social sciences and humanities. Um, how, does, how does this fit in? What, 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 I, what, are the, what are the structural ideological causes of the things Orlando is talking about becoming so controversial, especially in, uh, in recent years? Um, thank you. Um, I was very intrigued by your remarks, Orlando. I, my one reservation would be, as a social scientist, um, I don't think all social science would, would deny, you know, uh, the gender distinction. So I, I was thinking the, the, the problem, you know, which is, as, as you said in one of your, the, the pieces you, you gave you know, to circulate, is this is not a new phenomenon. It goes back to the 1960s. But I, I think where it comes from, it comes from... Um, um, not so much, um, I mean, if we, the, so the, the forcing house of all these ideas is the university. You know, the university is front and center of um, an attempt to undermine its classical foundations or its, um, you know, historical foundations. So the university w was an invention of the Middle Ages. It was about theologia, about, and it was about scholarship. And it transformed itself at the Rena Renaissance, and it went under another change in the Enlightenment. And from the 19th century, there was a project to make it practical utilitarian, which undermined scholarship. But from the 20th century, it became the, the, the forcing ground for a kind of Marxist or cultural Marxist or a deconstructionist agenda which saw no value 
in trad traditional scholarship. In fact, the whole um, approach was to deconstruct it, to overthrow it. So traditions of scholarship have come under huge um, pressure. And those who disagree with this transformative agenda, like yourself or others, find themselves, you know, fearful, you know, that they, they shut up, they, they hide, because academics historically are not particularly brave, you know. So, and, and then they lose perquisites and they, you know, don't get careers. Um, and, and the tragedy is that the, the, um, the very interesting Hungarian thinker, Thomas Molnar, wrote in the 60s about the decline of, of, of the intellectual. But he said um, it was in the intellectual of the post-World War who became the natural leaders and manipulators of utopia, a utopian project. So instead of the university being interested in uh, you know, classical understandings or disciplinary understandings that have been well established over time, whether you were doing biology or politics or English literature, this manipulation of reality became a, a university concern where these utopian manipulators view the emancipated university as the blueprint for the future society. So I would see the university and the way it's been um, hijacked by this um, uh, woke ideology, for want of a better word, has been so tragic. And we don't fight back against it. There's, you know, and if you do, well... You don't, you know, you have to come to the Danube Institute or MCC because there's nowhere else to go. May I repeat? Yes. Um, I entirely agree with you regarding the university, and I think we're, we're going to dive in, into that in a moment because, for sure, the university plays a key role um, in this madness. But there is also one thing. Of course, there are social scientists that are doing extremely serious work from the point of view of evolution. They are rare, but they exist in international relations as Sargat and Rox McDermott, in political science and Michael Van Peterson. There is people in Europe and in other countries that are, are doing this from a very serious point of view. But the thing is that social sciences, since the beginning, they took what anthropologist Pascal Voyer uh, claims was a, a fatal mistake, that they divorced themselves from biology. That's, that's something that happened, actually, we can't even give a date. It's like uh, 1903, and that was the debate between Emile Durkheim, that everybody knows, and Gabriel Tard, that nobody knows. Because Emile Durkheim was saying, well, that we should explain society by society, and Gabriel Tard was saying that, no, we should explain society maybe a little bit with the brain also. But he lost, even if he was a rock star back in the day, the 19th century in France. So uh, that moment, and then... This has been studied. For example, there are two evolutionary psychologists that talk about um, biophobia, or others talk about the standard social science model, that it's a model where actually you deny biology, you deny the implications of, of biology. Once again, as you were saying, there are serious, also serious people in uh, social sciences, but the problem, as you mentioned, is that the universities are chasing out these few people that are trying to do serious things. Yes. Um, good afternoon. Thank you very much to the Danube Institute for, for, for hosting this, this important talk. Um, just as a preliminary remark, how I want to stress that I have uh, two things in common with uh, Leonardo. The first one is the, the haircut. And, uh, <laughs> and the second one is that I also had the honor of being fired from Sciences Po. Not because of a specific course, but basically by, just by joining MCC. I've been teaching in Sciences Po for 14 years when I was in the European Commission. And then when I left the European Commission and uh, joined MCC, I think it took them one year to notice that I suddenly became incompatible. Mm -hmm. um, and the advantage of teaching 14 years in a place like Sciences Po is that you can also see indeed the evolution of the, you know, this rampant wokeism that really took over this institution. I was in a... In a in a campus that was actually very immune to that because uh, Sciences Po has some regional campuses in France and I was in the one dealing with, um, uh, so specialized in Central Europe, basically. And um, so we were far more preserved than Paris. I think the headquarters is really became a caricature that is totally comparable to what you can see in Harvard or uh, in uh, in. Uh, 
most of the Ivy League uh, universities. But in the in the in the regional campuses, it was less the case. In Central, not in the one of Central Europe, maybe because half their students were from Central Europe. And uh, but I noticed in the last three four years that things were changing. Uh, I remember once I asked my class, "What are you going to do in ten years?" And for the first time, the majority of my class, so basically twelve students, told me something about animal protection, animal rights. That was already a sign. Then I remembered that in the last two years I started having, like, you know, teaching in a, in a classroom that uh, had a lot of feminist, like, very, very aggressive, you know, like feminist propaganda posters. And I could also see in the laptop of my students that one third of the laptop had a very, very obvious um, a rainbow flag and of course mine had a sticker saying that sex is binary so I, I I just took the caution of covering it because you know you never know maybe they would have fired me two years before and so um, so that was indeed the uh, the the landscape and I think when when you see this reality in front of you you are actually sadly not even surprised I mean I, how come Leonardo that somebody even thought about programming your course in Sciences Po I mean, you should have been cancelled ideally six months before, not nine days before. But it's true that it's very, very sad because in a, an ideal world, we should not even have this discussion. The, the, the title, I mean, the raison d'être of the panel today in a reasonable society would never happen. And if it happens today, uh, it's because, indeed, you have very few places in Europe where you can have an open discussion on reality. Can I, can I ask, what are the wider, in your view, in your impression, what are the wider sociological impacts of it? The, the wider what, sorry? The wider, so, the wider societal impacts. Well, the wider societal impacts. I mean, first of all, to say that, indeed, the universities were the incubators of this virus, for sure. The problem is that the, the, the elites in general and uh, the governments in particular, including the international uh, organizations, became like the big super spreaders of that. I spent 13 years in the European Commission, and when I joined the MCC, I mean, one of the first texts I read from my former colleagues in 2020 was the uh, LGBT uh, strategy for November, from November 2020. And I will never forget that on page 18, second paragraph of this strategy, you have a sentence of the European Commission saying that, you know, we will also uh, promote, and here I'm quoting, self-determination of gender without age restrictions, without age restrictions. Um, apart from the fact that you, this, this document was rife of, of cult, of sectarian and like a para-religious, really uh, cultic uh, uh, language, like for example, like the sex assigned at birth, you know, like this expression, sex assigned at birth, but by whom? By, by the midwife, by, by, by the doctor, by the, the other mom being also giving birth uh, next, uh, next door. So, again, we are now in, the, in a delirium. What are the consequences of that? Because, indeed, the, 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 the first temptation is to say that nothing happens. Come on, this is like just a little delirium of some intellectuals. Those are like the spiritual children of Judith Butler writing in the press. No, it's much worse than that because the, the social consequences, especially when it comes to gender, first... Wokeism and identity politics brings an atomization of societies on the basis of race, on the basis of sex, on the basis of sexual orientation. Huh? Go in the U.S., and it's almost patent, especially in the U.S., in the field of race. Again, we have to measure what a immense historical regression it is to judge people by the color of the skin, by their sex, or by the way they have sex, basically. It's an immense regression. I mean, uh, it's the, the total opposite of, uh, of progress and the total opposite of what, for example, Martin Luther King was pleading. But when it comes to gender, and you know, if you look at the woke galaxy, there is one, two letters actually, two letters that are much more dangerous than the others. If you take the acronym LGBTI, AQ, and it can be extended, as you know, this is the short version because we don't have a lot of time. We, we have to make the difference between LGB and T and Q. And the problem is the T and the Q is trans and queer. And this is what gender is about. And so what, are, what is the worst consequence of that? Of course, that like the, 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 the violation of the innocence of our children, first of all. First, because you sexualize them. Uh, since they are four or five, we, we can all find on the Internet pictures 
uh, and sexual explicit content that is targeting a bit more than toddlers, like primary school. This is the first consequence. In the worst case scenario, we are also speaking about mutilations, about the mutilation of vulnerable teenagers. Yep. The double mastectomy is at the age of 13, 14, 15, 16. Uh, vaginoplasties, phalloplasties, hormones, um, uh, puberty blockers. Puberty blockers is basically the same molecule that is given, you know, to sexual offenders to castrate them. Except that you give them to children. To children, by the way, who cannot have a beer until they're 18 or cannot drive a big motorbike until they're 23. And so they cannot choose their bedtime, but they can choose to castrate themselves for the rest of their life. They can choose, for example, to, to basically kill their sexual life because the puberty blockers prevent you from having orgasms from the rest of your life. They are allowed to turn themselves into chronic patient because, you know, one thing is to suffer from, from, um, from gender dysphoria, which is something that is identified in, me in medical literature for years already. And if you take the decision at 25 to change sex and to go into a, a surgery for that, well, that's your problem. It's your decision. You are 25. You're an adult. This is, but please, you sh this should be an informed decision because you're going to turn yourself into a chronic patient, somebody who will, sorry about the details, somebody who will not, not be able to have uh, 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 an erection, somebody who is going to have like permanently some urinary complications, um, uh, somebody, for example, somebody who, if you stop taking testosterone even after 10 years, you're going to have your period again. Uh -huh. And so... The, the consequence number one, and this is absolutely sordid, and this is really an ideology of, I am sorry about the expression of rainbow mengeles. Huh? This is, I mean, where basically we are mutilating children in the name of an ideology. Huh? So this is happening. And the second victim of this T and Q are women, are women, because this ideology is absolutely misogynist, misogynist to a point that you cannot even conceive. Look at the way they call now women. Women are became, sorry about that, menstruators. Women became persons with a front hole, uh, breeders, first of all. I mean, can we put that into perspective? Can you realize that not even the Taliban's call women like that? And second, it means also that women are less safe uh, because now, you know, a man like any of us with a bit of lipstick can go into a woman's toilet, for example. It means that some lesbians are now forced, forced to, to sleep, to have sexual intercourse with a man that uh, thinks is a woman or pretends to be a woman because otherwise she is transphobic. So this ideology is actually detrimental for children in the very first place, women in the very second, and also for the L and the G. Because, you know, they are denying even the existence of homosexuality. Because um, what is an homosexual for the trans, for the trans crazy people, for the trans uh, Mengele's and Nazis? What is a, a, a gay for them? A gay is a man who actually is a woman. And so he should be operated. Uh, he should be added. And so... That's Those are the then social make consequences. A, we come full circle then, because then we go back to... So we, we started out, the ideological journey went from, okay, there are two... With the two uh, biological sexes that correspond to two gender identities. Oh, no, we don't like that. There are many gender identities. Okay. And now we go back to made full circle where we start treating uh, men that, have, uh, that, that are homosexual and have a, uh, uh, perhaps a bit of a, a different touch, let's say. Uh, we identify that then as female and then, and then, and then we put them outside of the, yeah. the male category, which, is, which, which would just reinforce the, the original stereotypical, the most, the most narrow-minded version of the concept of maleness that was probably more narrow-minded than the most classical narrow-minded totally. vision that anyone may have held in the 1950s. It's totally based on stereotypes. It's enough for a gender activist to see that a, a, a young man is a bit effeminated or a lady likes to play football to tell him or her that actually you are born in the wrong body. You are born in the wrong body. Orlando, so... so um, this, this clearly has a lot of real-world consequences, these ideological developments for, for real people. 
Um, but it all starts with such innocent phrases like uh, sex assigned at birth. Uh, what, what's going on there? Well, the thing here is what, and, and of course, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more uh, with what has been said by Rodrigo. And just to add a little thing to that, you know that in Spain with the new uh, trans law, you, it's like professors, like school professors are required uh, to signal in case that, for example, a boy is playing with dolls or a girl is playing with a football and it, because he could have been born in the wrong body. Um, but what is going on here, it's, let's take the... the um, what Sciences Po said as an argument when the classes were, were, were cancelled? Uh, they, they gave lots of different reasons over the days. It was pretty embarrassing. But finally, I think that the communication people got uh, aligned with something. They said, well, that the, the, the courses uh, didn't comply with the scientific requirements of the institution. Once again, an institution where you have 82 classes on gender from the point of view of, of gender ideology, of gender, of feminism, and all that. But this, this is crucial. This is the thing. The epistemic authority nowadays, it's held by those that claim this kind of madness. And this is changing everything. It's like in, in my own case, it was, well, for example, the, the major biologists and psychologists that teaching in the main universities in the world, they were considered worthless for the gender scholars. Therefore, they were not scientific. And the thing is that we are seeing this also not only in the social sciences, but we are seeing this also in biology, in the hard sciences. And you, you see it in many ways. Like, for example, now you have lots of biologists that are trying to uh, disprove things that have been proven for a long time. For example, they are trying to say that uh, women were also hunters. There were some women that were hunters, of course, but it was mostly male. So, you know, and, and the, the, the biologists that are courageous nowadays, they have to lose time in order to disprove these things. Um, another another thing regarding this, well, you have this with, with biologists infiltrating any, any way, but also how recently one of the main biologists alive, Jerry Cohn, he wrote a piece with another biologist, Luana Maruja, saying that biology in the near future, not in 50 years, maybe just in 5 or 10 years, it will look entirely different of what it has been. Because researchers, the questions that they ask... The hypothesis that they advance in, in order to reply to those, to those questions must all comply to political standards of correctness or wokeness, whatever you call it. It's like nowadays, just to give an example, nowadays, if you're going to do a study in neuroscience, neuroscience, when you ask you know, like the questions, I don't know if you have any family issues, any kind of problem, they're going to ask you if you're male, female, or non-binary. Neuroscience, that's like asking if you're male, female, or an angel. So all this is, is, is going to transform um, in many ways science, and these people are the ones... Is, for example, do you, do you remember that I just mentioned Colin Wright, like this biologist? Well, the guy is outside academia trying to make the point that actually in biology there is male and female. But you have other people, like a particular professor of primatology at Princeton University, that uses his tenure position in order to claim that if you say that there is male and female, you're a bigot. So we are at this situation, and this has terrible consequences for society in any level, because public policies are based, most of the time, in some kind of expert advice. So, yeah, David, I, I, feel, that, I feel that we're, drawing, we're coming to the conclusion that Though we're talking specifically about uh, gender and biological sex, uh, we are we're led in, we led to the conclusion that there is a that there is a, a wider transformation of the epistemic authority with the kinds of arguments that we make with the argumentative style. Yeah, um, I think uh, Orlando's point is very important. You know that um, the criteria, that the idea that when you did scientific inquiry or even social scientific inquiry you start with a, um, a, a hypothesis that can be falsified. You know, that there is no um, pure truth. Um, there is only um, a testable hypothesis that can be re and re re-examined and um, questioned. And then the principle of falsifiability, which was Karl Popper's in the, you know, the logic of scientific discovery, has been uh, honoured only in the breach now. So... 
So it, it's not only impossible to do um, real science, it's impossible to do philosophy, it's impossible to do history, because it doesn't fit with the prevailing criteria that have been set from an ideological purpose, not from a purpose of scholarship. So, you know, coming back to Rodrigo's point, well, this is so regressive and so damaging that, um, you know, the university which perpetuates all this is, is a failed institution now, and we need, you know, another alternative. The, the other aspect, which I thought, which, you know, comes back to some of the points about L, LB, LGBTQI is... Plus, plus, plus don't plus, forget plus, the plus. Plus, plus, plus. plus. Um, but the, the other one that, you know, permeates the university, started with the universities and then proliferated again uh, across the, um, you know, the political sector, the, 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 the bureaucracy, the media, and into business with catastrophic consequences is EDI, Equality, Diversity and Inclusivity, which should be D-I-E, really, because we're dying from it, you know? Uh, and, you know, those criteria now are applied to, you know, courses. Um, if it's not, you know, diverse, inclusive and equal, then you, you don't teach it. And if it doesn't... And the other aspect of it is... It, you know, it, it's identifying racism, gender, uh, anti-transgender topics. So it has to be actually destroyed, decolonized. So the, the decolonization agenda that goes with the EDI agenda is not a, is is so um, uh, you know rebarbative that w that we're in you know the most damaging state through our own stupidity, really. Can I, can I go to a slightly more uplifting angle then? This is all very bleak. What, what should we do? And I would like to hear all, all three speakers on this. Okay. Oh, please. Then fight, first of all, by speaking up. And also, for example, to uh, give back the power to parents. Parents have been passive until now, but parents are the origin, the bastions of resistance. We basically we, we can we can see also that in the in the U.S., which basically the U.S. was the super spreader of this French virus called um, deconstructionism, but we can also see some of the recipes coming from there. And the the what we see so far is that it's it's now important. And let me use a woke word to empower uh, parents uh, because they can be like the best counterweight you know to the to, to the academic and to the even bureaucracies in schools huh? first of all um, reality and when I say reality is that I even heard that recently BlackRock BlackRock which is the biggest investment in, in investment fund in the world BlackRock which has like the third GDP after the US and China and BlackRock which used to be until a couple of weeks ago the main um, vector, the main promoter of this uh, of this uh, criteria, ESG criteria that you mentioned, uh, David, is for the first time taking a bit of distance with those criteria, at least when it comes to the sustainability. Because of course, sustainability. Again, don't forget that the green uh, cult is also part of the woke galaxy. And uh, thank you, farmers, for reminding us that. Thank you for, for, for having this like a bite of reality. And so, again, it's not good for business. It was in, in, interesting as well to see, for example, all the boycott behind Budweiser. Budweiser, which is basically like the classic beer brand, had this great idea. Some, probably uh, the head of marketing was studying one of the Ivy League universities to, to take a trance. Basically, somebody who is mocking women who is mocking women, who is doing, is, 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 is making, again, like he's a caricature of a woman as the main brand, the image of the brand. And what happened there is that, you know, like the, 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 the specific brand of Budweiser basically was lost millions, hundreds of millions. Another example is Disney. Disney, for example, is no longer, is no more a profitable company the way it used to be because basically they are, they're really buying 
all the, um, the, 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 the wokeism. And also to fight politically, because one of the harmful consequences, not only at the social level, is also that those ideologies are pushed, are pushed by international organizations and uh, by, um, by, by the public, uh, by, by the legislators. Can we, let me just give you two examples. The first one is like you already have, for example, in Canada, in British Columbia, uh, in, the, in one of the provinces of Canada, a legislation that basically uh, can take parents to jail, huh? can deprive them of their freedom if they don't uh, mm-hmm. uh, refer to their children with the right pronouns. So if they misgender them. By the way, we agreed, Eric, that you will ask our pronouns before we start. Yeah, I, 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 I suddenly yes, I, I start to get really worried now because I, I, I plan to ask each speaker what their preferred gender was, but I forgot to ask, so that's why I had to avoid pronouns the entire evening. Come to we, we get us proud. No, I'm offended. I won't tell you. I'm offended now. But that, this, is a, this is already a, an example. Imagine you can go to jail in Canada. Look at also at the, the legislation in the making now in Scotland and in Ireland. In Ireland, they're preparing a hate speech law. Basically, can also take you to jail, can deprive you of your freedom if you have a couple of memes uh, on your phone about trans people. So I'm eligible for that. But a, a, a much more uh, relevant example for, for Hungary is that one of the reasons why Hungary where the EU is confiscating billions to Hungary, billions, one of them is because the Hungarian government has a legislation on the protection of minors, which bans gender theory and also the promotion of homosexuality, both things, and also in general, like sex for minors. They don't want to sexualize children. And this is taken as discrimination by the EU. And again, they say it black and white in their press releases. This law is, uh, until they don't withdraw this law, they're not going to get the rest of the money, basically the 18 billion, 18 billion that, they still, that the EU still owe to Hungary. So again, it became like almost compulsory. It seems that to, to teach gender theory in schools uh, became like a European value. And it also seemed that suddenly on the basis of principles of European values in the, in, in, in the name of a moral superiority, suddenly the EU has the competence to educate sexually children in Europe as, as well, which is also something that is extremely, extremely dangerous. And let me just give you a last example, a super boring example. Uh, but on that basis, the EU is also you know, freezing some money, uh, some billions to Hungary. There is a legislation in the EU called the Common Provision Legislation. This is extremely technical. It's a regulation of 544 pages. It's about, you know, the way you spend the EU funds. So don't read it t- tonight. It's extremely boring unless you want your kids to, to go to bed in, in 10 minutes. But in those 500 pages, you have an Article 9. And this Article 9 says that first, all the funds must be spent in accordance with the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, paragraph 1. And paragraph 2 says that all the funds must be uh, spent uh, with uh, gender mainstreaming and with the principle of uh, gender equality. I mean, how do you build a bridge with the gender perspective? I still don't know. But I know that on the basis of Article 9, uh, this is the, the, the legal basis they have to basically... Uh, confiscate um, billions to Hungary if they want to. Because again, if they want to, they launch it against Hungary. But look at the arbitrariness. We all heard for 10 years that uh, Poland was suffering from a systemic um, infringement of the rule of law. It seems that with a new government in a couple of weeks, all these systemic problems disappeared because yesterday they announced that the 137 billion that they owe to Poland will be suddenly released. There is recently an astronomer who lost her funding from the European Union because she was not able to justify the gender perspective of her studies on galaxies. This is true. So I believe that what can be done and what should be done are two different things. What can be done, I believe that Rodio has already said it, fight. What should be done, I think that is pretty obvious, is in face of us, but it's extremely difficult to apply. Let me ask you something. Will we accept that medical doctors, rather to be trained in anatomy, are trained in astrology, rather to be trained in microbiology, are trained on shamanism? We'll not accept that. So why are we still accepting university degrees that are worthless? That's the only point. What should be done is take away the epistemic authority that university still has and that it doesn't deserve anymore because it has lost it. 
There are people that say that we should defund the university. I agree with that, but I don't think that that's not even the way to go. Maybe that later. The first thing is, for example, to become a civil servant. I mean, once again, do you want civil servants like in France, like the higher ones, 90% that, have, that come from Sciences Po? Do, do you feel safe with these people holding the future of the country? So what should be done to begin with, I believe, is this. But, of course, it's a little bit difficult. David. Uh, I think um, what Orlando and Rodrigo said is yeah, absolutely right. I, I, I can't see how the university sector recovers at the moment in, in any kind of um, intelligible way. So you need you know, new universities or you need a sort of commission of inquiry into universities to see why they've um, traduced their, their mission statements, really. Um, I suppose the other thing, the, the other area which is um, you know, pointed out earlier on is that we now live with a so um, fragmented society that elites have embraced this ideology you know, to the court. And um, it, you have this proliferation of a, a viewpoint which is almost surreal. It's almost Swiftian in its, um, uh, uh, you know, logical absurdity, but is believed so wholeheartedly by an elite group who, who, who hold on to the reins of power, uh, perquisites, distribution of, 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 of high-profile positions. And, and the consequences are that you've got this huge gap between what this elite think and what the, the man in the street thinks. So you've got a democratic crisis on your hands at the moment, and there are, you know, so-called far-right groups, but a lot of them are just about issues that in 20 years ago would just be called common sense, you know, that a man's a man, a woman's a woman, that, um, you know, migration levels are perhaps a tad too high, that, um, you know, London is controlled by Islamists, which it is, uh, but you can't say that. And it comes down to a point that I think Camus made. Um, the misuse of words will be, it, it adds to the misfortunes of the world. And we've got a very unfortunate world we're facing at the moment. Well, I, I must say that the, the speakers certainly on this panel certainly are, uh, are not lacking in outspokenness. We, uh, this was, this was uh, quite, a, quite a fun uh, journey into, the, uh, into Darwinian uh, perspectives on gender. But now we'd like to hear from the audience, and uh, we're going to have uh, the Q&A. So please, uh, uh, please uh, if, you, if you have a question, briefly state your name and then uh, uh, succinctly state a question. Thank you. Hi, my name is Robert Greenfield. Uh, my son is a graduate of Seattle's Po. So... Um, yeah, what can I say? And lots of friends from there also. I obviously did not realize it was as uh, severe, uh, but now I understand why my son says some of the things that he says now, which I thought they were anomalies, but they're not. My question to you is this, if this has been a 100-year trend, how do you start reversing the trend? It's easy for to say the word fight. Fight is not something that is, it's a kind of like big word, but uh, I'm a writer, I write uh, center left to center right. I believe that the vast majority of the world is far more um, educated than most uh, elites feel. I feel that either the far right or the far left are actually obscuring what most people are really wanting to do, which is to say for Rodrigo side, which is to raise their kids in a nice uh, and a reasonable environment so that they can be uh, successful. So my question to you is instead of just saying fight, how do you begin to re reverse a hundred years of uh, elitism that is now clearly out of control? Thank you. So just to, to be more concrete, you're right, fighting is not uh, concrete enough. Um, let me be concrete. You do, for example, uh, a class action against all the surgeons that, are, that mutilated thousands of teenagers, and those teenagers now, half of them at least, regret when they are 20. So I'm waiting for a good lawyer in the U.S. to have a class action, not only from a criminal point of view, but from a civil point of view with, you know, like hundreds of millions of uh, damages there. If you do that, uh, then the insurance companies will no longer insure this business, and then you can kill it already. Second thing you do, like 
the Hungarian government does, or for example, Ron DeSantis does in the in Florida, where basically you prohibit those things. So there is a political response, and you also have to make sure that you that, that you elect the right leaders. That conservative people do not end up voting for politicians that will never do the job. And and I was absolutely not referring to the European People's Party. Yeah? Um, and um, and so those are concrete things. And then in the more long run, I mean, honestly, cultural wars. I know it sounds a bit cliche, but if Judith Butler, starting with her bullshit in a little chair, probably in the minus three of the faculty in Stanford 40 years ago, but those things at the end now became legislation, maybe we have to do the same. So uh, the long march towards the institution started already in, on the conservative side, and we also have to reconquer part of the of, of the, the total obviously the, the the academy but that takes time but in the meantime legal offensive politic offensive uh, uh, political activism like you know like against for example those companies those work companies and let me just give you a concrete example in france uh, in france like the diploma to to become um, a teacher like a serious teacher is called the aggregation and l'agrégation 40 years ago, the majority of agrégés were uh, leftists, May 68 I talk people. Today, the majors, and so the, not only the majority, but the best, you know, the, uh, um, the students that get the aggregation are um, young Catholic militants. That's the beginning. But for this one, you have to wait. But in the meantime, if you find a lawyer who's ready to make millions by killing the business of those Mengele surgeons, I think that we also have a good point there. Yes, and one thing that I will add to that is like in in an upcoming piece of book chapter that will come about, I believe, in, in fall, um, what, what I propose, it's like, for example, you mentioned you're a journalist, you're a writer, and like everybody, it's like, okay, I said we should, you know, try to, to, take the, to take away the epistemic authority of university. How do we do that, you know, at the level, for example, of a journalist? Well, let's say that you encounter an expert, an academic, a professor, like in any university, the, even the, the better ones. So let's make him pass a Darwin test. What is that? It's like, okay, you are claiming some to explain something about society. You are saying, well, I'm going to tell you this behavior, this thing, how it is. Okay, what you're saying, does it contradict the theory of evolution of Charles Darwin? It's a very simple question. If the answer is no, because this person is, for example, or just a demographer that is just telling you, in this city, there is like uh, this percentage of people that votes for this party and this other percentage that votes for this other party. That's very easy going, clear, no explanation needed. So you don't need to pass any Darwin test. There is not a problem. But if the person is trying to explain something and what he's saying goes against the theory of evolution, or this person knows nothing about how the brain works, how the mind works, how evolution works, then this person is not worth of your time and of your ink, even if it's the biggest professor in the biggest university. Yes, um, I'm Chris Herdell. I'm uh, also a victim of cancer culture, but for a totally different uh, subject, which is European iconography. That means it's the research and the inquiry about what is specific in the uh, European uh, production of uh, pictures for the last 3,000 years. And of course, a great part of this is uh, the Catholic Christian uh, iconography, which transports also moral, um, um, extremely important moral um, uh, paradigms, which are questioned today. Uh, so um, my personal experience is that the academic sector, uh, before I was teaching at the Academy of Fine Art in Prague, yeah, but I was also a free lecturer with different institutions. So about 25 years ago, when um, um, uh, the, the scene was relatively open, it was possible to, to present an, a, a proposal, and very often, not always, but very quite often, the institution would uh, would uh, reply in a, in a positive way. Uh, I even lectured 12 years ago at CEU when it was still there. Yeah? So this has changed totally. Yeah? And this is the, a symbol and a sign of a totalitarian system. We are now in a totalitarian regime already. Yeah? 
Now, the France problem... Could you, sorry, France, could, you, could you address your question to one of the speakers, please? So, yeah, sorry, I, uh, it's, it's very interesting. We're kind of running out of time. Is it not interesting? No, it is, it is. But we're running well, out of time. This Thank so, you. So, <laughs> um, the question is that very often today, the decision takers have no clue, have no competence, not of history, not of um, European history, of uh, you ask, you wonder what they are competent about. I take the German government as an example. So, how are you going to engage any kind of positive, constructive discussion with people yeah, uh, who have no clue of nothing, yeah? incompetence? Yeah? It is it, yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm very sorry for what happened to you. And actually, what is um, it's interesting here is that even if we don't we don't see that firsthand, there is a dual relationship between the cancellation of the Western culture and the cancellation of biology. And why is that? If you don't understand human nature, you don't understand that the Western civilization, this is the greatest civilization has ever been on Earth, actually has become to be so prosperous, so rich because it has enforced institutions that go in the direction of what Steven Pinker called the better, the better angels of our nature, right? So the better part of us. If you don't understand human nature, you think that you can change people as you will and that you can, you know, any culture values the same thing as another. So I believe that the, the cancellation of biology, the cancellation of, of the tradition, the iconoclastic or the classical or whatever tradition of the West, actually it's, it's two faces of the same coin. Yeah, I, I, I think the... Um... I mean, it's, it's very interesting that, you know, the West, Western civilization is a unique civilization because it was an inquiring one. It didn't have a hierophantic order, a priesthood that imposed a, an orthodoxy. It was always open to ideas and it always looked outwards. And, and what's happened now is under this assault by this, um, you know, ubiquitous ideological form that sort of corrosive at, at every level and, and what you've ended up with is a kind of um, well Rodrigo mentioned the long march over the, through the institutions the, the first long march was of course Mao in China the second long march began in 1968 under Maoist um, influence with Rudi Deutschke uh, you know sort of citing the term we must have the long march through the institutions to revolutionize them to completely overthrow culture. It was a cultural revolution. And we're living now with a, a, the effective, the, the, um, the, the uh, elites are our equivalent of a red guard, really. And, and we now have a, a red guard that is, you know, undermining every facet of what we valued, whether it was iconography, whether it was, you know, art, whether it's history. Everything has now been reduced to a kind of rubble and you're sort of looking around shell shot thinking where do we go from here so you know I mean Rodrigo's right we, we, we have to begin to fight back but unless there's some kind of organized you know um, purpose unless we can actually I mean I'm, I'm a bit skeptical about lawyers doing it because every lawyer I've ever met has you know sued me or uh, threatened me so um, um, I don't know I, I think there's got to be a political reaction I think there's got to be um, you know so, some kind of coming together I, I've written recently about the need for a secret university you know that goes back to you know traditional concepts and and tries to you know go back to scholarship really that, that's my yeah. Yeah, just just a, a quick uh, remark on that. We should also go back to paper. When I saw last week the results of the um, uh, Google artificial intelligence engine that basically was depicting the founding fathers, Gemini, exactly, the founding fathers of the U.S. as being black and basically saying things that were totally stupid. And so basically it's a source of ignorance. I think now we should cherish uh, our books like never ever before. Don't throw a single book. Maybe those books in 20 years are going to be gold. And again, we should have standards. Anyone who hasn't read 50 books in his life and give us the list as a credential we should not even interview him for a job. We have time for one last question. Hi, Jim. Hi, Gav Duncan. Just... Uh slightly different aspect. If we look at this from a cruel, unfeeling point of view, which I'm not suggesting any of you ever would, 
whilst fighting against this insanity, is it not possible that we should perhaps fight on the one hand and then wait for the penny to drop on the other hand and for these people to realise that, oh, good God, I have turned myself into a mutant and for them to then realise that, well, in that case, I do need to blame somebody, my parents, my doctors, uh, teachers, whatever. Will that not eventually lead to the resolution of the problem or is... Uh, <laughs> Can I? Uh, no, actually, I, I see your point, but the, the phenomena that we're seeing, it's the opposite. For example, who are the ones that are really in the case? I believe that you were mentioning the case of, the case of trans children. I believe that that was your example. So just to, to continue on that. Um, so what we are seeing is that who are the, the, the fighters that are the, the, the fiercest warriors to go into this madness? The parents that have had their children, you know, mutilated. And that's, that's normal from the point of view of how the brain works. Because you cannot accept the monstrosity that you have committed. It's, it's a human thing. You cannot. So they're going to fight till the end. So this is not going to pass. It's like uh, we cannot just sit and wait. Yeah, I, I agree. I, For me, it's not a trend. It's not right. a trend that we, oh, it's so stupid. It's so absurd. It's, so, it's not sustainable. So it will, buy, it will die by itself. Except that in the meantime, they, if we don't do anything, they can become even more hegemonic than now. And honestly, I am pessimistic because the way I see it is like a schism. I see the Western world being divided between the walks and the anti walks The way we were divided among religions 500 years ago, um, so maybe without killing each other, but I see it you know, as, a, as a huge philosophical and even territorial line. Look at the EU. You have wokeism everywhere except in the former communist countries, basically. And, uh, and again, given now the power, because you mentioned that also, David, is also the big companies, like the multinationals are wokes today. So it's academia, most of the media, most of the multinationals, uh, public uh, empowerments, uh, supranational organizations. They have everything. So if we don't start resisting now, uh, at the end, I'm afraid that double mastectomies might get compulsory in the near future. Oh. Wow, we covered quite some train in this uh, in this uh, one hour discussion. Uh, I would like uh, the audience to uh, uh, thank our speakers. Thank you very much.